my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praise is my Savior. Today's scripture reading is going to be from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. Chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, had forgiven you. If we applied that verse that was just read, it would go a long way in helping solve a lot of problems, wouldn't it? I was told to remind everyone that, of course, we it was announced Levi's surgery is in the morning, it will be, or tomorrow, it will be in the morning at 8 o'clock, so that way you will know. Uh, we want to keep him in prayer, and always the family. You know, if you have a child having surgery, that's, uh, there's no minor surgery when it's your child. That, that, so we, we understand that. So we are praying for the family, and we certainly love the Russell family. Well, I had to put a cough drop in before I got up here. I wait after the Lord's Supper to do that because my mouth gets so dry I wouldn't be able to talk with just a few words. I don't know if that's just natural or because of medication, but uh, a lot of preachers use a, a cough drop, and some preachers do that as a, a sign of when it's time to quit. When the cough drop is gone, that's when the sermon ends. <laughs> but uh, mistakenly, one day a brother put a reached in his pocket and put a button in his mouth. And after two hours, they finally had to stop it because it never did go away. Uh, well, it's supposed to cool off a little bit later this week, so we're going to have one week of fall, one week of winter, one week of spring, then it'll be summer again. <laughs> so uh, you, you already know that, don't you? But uh, we enjoy whatever God gives us. That's important. God knows what we need better than we do. Uh, you know, sometimes we complain, but could you imagine if man was in charge, how bad he would mess things up? He certainly would make a mess of things. It wouldn't be what it really should be. God knows what we, what we need. And I want us to think today, and you're going to have to use your Bibles like you had to use your song books. There's no PowerPoint to this, but there's nothing wrong with that either. It's good to pick that Bible up. Some of you use tablets. I'm still the old-fashioned kind. I've, I've got to have that uh, that paperback in my hands and uh, or leather-bound in, in my hands and use that. But today we want to study about a, uh, a child that was uh, uh, favored by his father. I'm not, Carol, I'm having trouble with that word. Winslow. <laughs> so... Uh, it's easy to write down, but it's harder for me to pronounce. So you get the idea of what, what I'm saying. When we go through life, everybody goes through hardships in life. You can stop and think for a moment. If everything was perfect in this life, why would you want to go to heaven anyway? It would already be perfect. There'd be no need to change anything. We'd already have everything that we desire, and everything would be in perfect condition. It's not like that. And we that have lived any time at all, we understand that. Life can throw some curveballs at you, can it? But now, with some people, uh, it seems that they have difficulties. We know everybody does, but you never hear them say anything about that. Then other people are more talkative. They will tell you what's going on with them. And uh, so people are different. 
But uh, we want to look at some, day, uh, some things today that can cause problems that perhaps we can help change in our own lives. Do you realize some things in our lives that are bad is our own fault and we can do something about that? When you take the world, Karen and I spoke just for a minute and we could have spoke for hours on the subject we were talking about, about the condition of the country. It's good is, is bad and bad is good in our society. You, you know that already. We could spend a, a lot of time discussing that. But the point is, our society could help itself if it would just turn to God, wouldn't it? Think of how much it would change the lives of the people. One thing I do find strange, I don't know if you uh, are familiar, familiar with what happened this past week in Homa, but a woman threw her 18-month-old son over a bridge. Now, she did decide to go in after him, but now, I, I find it strange something here. They, they put her in jail. You say, Mark, why do you find that strange? Well, you can kill a baby. There's no difference. Brethren, it's still a child, isn't it? So, yes, society has it upside down. But let's look at some things that may change the way that we view things. And the way that we view things, our view of the world, may ourself and others, it matters how we look at things. If we have a, a negative outlook on ourselves and everybody else, it's always bad. That's how we're going to be ourselves is a negative person. We need to be positive people in a negative society, one that is very sinful. And it's society. Men, men have not really changed throughout history. They, they are pretty much the same. I want us to first read in the 37th chapter of Genesis. I'll give you just a moment to get there, but it's going to be the basis of our study today, and we will gain most of our points from this. It's something that you're familiar with. When Jacob and his sons, and especially Joseph, a land of Canaan, that's where God told Abraham to go, Abram at the time he was told to go. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old, so we know what age he was at this point. We don't have to guess at it. It's told to us. Sometimes we don't know the exact age of Timothy or Titus. They're young. But we don't know how young. But he was 17 at this time. And he was feeding the flock with his brethren, his brothers, as we would say. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Now, having wives, that, that will get you in trouble to begin with, too, having more than one. Some, you know, sometimes people will say, well, in the Old Testament, they had more than one. It always led to problems, didn't it? And I, I'm not joking with that statement. Uh, that's serious. It, it always led, led to problems. <clears throat> and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. He didn't speak so well of his brothers, did he, and what, what they were doing. See, he was sent out, Joseph, go and bring me, Jacob, a report of what your brothers are doing. Now, we'll come to some uh, other points in a moment. But it says, now Israel, who is Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children. Problem already. You see already there's going to be a problem in the family. Now, it says, because he was the son of his old age. Now, there's something else that made him a favorite. He was born of Rachel. And Jacob favored Rachel much more than Leah, didn't he? And so he loved Rachel much, much more than Leah that he ever did those other wives. And he favored Joseph over the children that were born to him from those other wives. And it says he loved him because of his old age and made him a coat of many colors. So we are told that in the Bible, what made them jealous? One, favoritism. But he made him, out of all the other children, a coat that stands out above everything else. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. 
What did it cause? Because of the favoritism. He hated, they hated him. And it goes on to say from that point on, and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren. And they hated him yet the more. And he said unto, unto them, Here I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood around about and made of we such to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams. How much more can they hate him? You, you start to wonder. And for his words, and he dreamed yet another dream. And he told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the, uh, and the moon and the eleven stars he sent to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. Now he's, now he's included his father in this. And his father rebuked him and said unto, unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee and to the earth? And his brethren envied him. But, the, but his father observed this saying, and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem, and Israel, again Jacob, said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send thee unto them. And he said to his father, Here am I. Now, stop and reason, reason first. It said he's the favorite. It, it clearly says that. Now imagine most of us, now Butch, I know you and your family, you had lots of brothers and sisters. You had almost as many as he had, but most of us don't have that many. But regardless, when you pick out one out of the whole bunch that is the favorite, what happens to the others? They despise that one. So you see, the father had part in making his son envied by his other brothers. And it says they hated him. And it even built up to the point they wanted to kill him, as we know further in the reading of the scriptures. But what started it was, his, was the favoritism by the father. And his father went even to the point of making him the coat of many colors. Now this coat was not the kind he would wear out and get dirty and take care of the sheep and do the manual labor. So that indicates he's not out there with his brother, brethren doing this, but what does he do? He goes on, out there to check on them, and he goes back to his father, and he reports on them, Father, they're not doing the job that they should be doing. That makes them even madder. Look what happens when favoritism is shown in children. That's one thing, brethren, we should teach our children to do. And I tried to teach mine, even when they're young, you have to teach them when they're young. Teach them to learn to work. They need to learn to be those that will work and labor with their hands. What do you see going on right now in our society? There's places even closing down because they can't find workers. We need those that are willing to work. Well, let's notice uh, first in our study... If you had it on the board, this would be point number one. Trouble comes from family dynamics. What is in the household? And I want you to understand, I, I realize we don't, at this point right here, we look out and we don't have a lot of young children at this moment. We do have several young people in this congregation, just not at this particular moment. They all seem to be elsewhere today. Maybe they can go back and look at this. But it will help us all, I think, when our children see friction between mom and dad. And they see those, those arguments, those fights that take place. Hopefully, it's, when I say fights, I'm not thinking physically, but some even go to that point, don't they? That sticks with them for the rest of their lives. What took place, and it, it changes them. You know.
that abuse their uh, wives and children or abuse themselves. That's where it comes from or at least starts. Not always, not always, but a lot of times what they see in the household. What do they see in our households? How do we treat others in the family? And it starts with the father. The father is supposed to be the one that guides the family toward heaven. But a lot of times that doesn't happen, does it? The father is not the person that he is supposed to be. He is not following God's word himself. How often do we see a woman bringing the children to worship and the father is not even in the picture at all, especially when it comes to their spiritual training that's left to the mother? So what do they see in that household? What are they taught is of value? I heard uh, some comments made in class. I didn't make any, but I was listening to some of your comments about what is on TV. I remember one that stuck out quite well. Walt Disney, uh, one of you said he would roll over in his grave if he saw what was going on today. Well, that is true, isn't it? And you know why? Because Disney today is not what Disney used to be. There was a time when you said, well, it's a Disney movie. You could say, oh, it, it's, it's okay. Not, not today. So we have to guard our family, not just the children, but we may say especially the children because of what comes on those TV programs. It can influence our children and those computers and those devices they can put in their hands. I can't work my thumbs like they do. I'm one that goes, uh, uh, some of you probably like that too. It takes me a long time to send a text message. But they can send a text message, uh, message and their friends send one, and they send one right back. doesn't take long. And what they see on the Internet, oh, all that's on the Internet certainly isn't good, is it? So guard thy home, what people see in the home. And understand something. Once those children see certain things on TV, when they're young, that image is burned into their mind and will cause problems later on in life as adults. Don't think that it's gone. Well, they forgot all about that. No, they didn't. It doesn't mean they have to talk about it, but that is burned into their minds, things that they should have never seen. Adults shouldn't see it either. Because it is against God's will. And think about this for just a moment. What about when we on Saturday night either go to the movies or in our, our homes watch a movie that certainly our Lord would not approve of. Then we go the very next day, the first day of the week, and worship God. Is he happy with us? So guard what your family sees in your home. And fathers, lead your families. It falls upon us first. Not the mothers, they have their role. Not the children, they have their role. But it starts with the fathers and then goes to the others of what they must do. Trouble sometimes comes from outside the family. We understand this. There are some things that happen to us that is beyond our control. Now, some that I can think of that Tina and I talked about on the way to uh, services. Uh, Russell Klein, I don't know if this has been in the bulletin or not, but his wife actually, it was at Polishing the Pulpit, Anthony and Claudia, Claudia, you may have heard of this, but uh, it was uh, when they had gone to lunch, his wife was getting in, into the van and missed uh, the step, you know, getting into the van, you can imagine and broke her femur bone. But that has led to so much more problems, uh, you know, even uh, problems they're having to deal with, and really a bad, bad situation. I, I'm not really qualified to tell you all that's going on. And so they didn't do anything to bring on that themselves. Yes, I realize she's the one that missed the step, but that's, you understand what I'm saying. She's got severe problems, they don't know what's going to happen at this point. Another one that I know that we have prayed for 
is Tish Clark, B.J. Clark's wife. Cancer that they found above the brain. And that has been removed as best they can, but now they have to start those treatments. Now they are optimistic because there's so much more treatment now that is better than, the, and this is from the doctor, not me, than there was 10 years ago. We're thankful for that, aren't we? But we see that there are problems sometimes that happen in families, and you could name, you could name so many more. We could spend a, a lot of time doing that, but the point is, sometimes those things happen to our families, and it's out of our control. And so we have to understand that. What do you do then? And fathers and mothers, this is important. It's important that our children, during those difficult times, see that we still stay faithful to God. I've seen people turn from God when difficult times come. Well, if this is what I get for serving God, I'm not going to serve God. And so they give up altogether. That's not a wise thing, to say the least. They need to stay where they have the benefit of prayer and that God will bless them. So what do they see in that home? And sometimes that trouble comes from outside the home that we uh, never saw coming. And I remember, it's not been long ago, actually, it was at Philip Patton's uh, funeral, and he was 48 years old, died from COVID. We went to Texas for the funeral, sat in there talking to Tish Clark. Never dreamed that a year or two later, she would be in this condition. None of us ever saw that coming. I remember we were all talking about gun smoke, and BJ's father, TJ, uh, loves gun smoke. So I, you know, we talked about, boy, you two would have a lot in common. And so how quickly things change. Life changes in a hurry, doesn't it? So some things are beyond our control. Now, number three, trouble comes from doing foolish things. We may primarily think of this in, in youth, you know, like Joseph obviously, obviously made some mistakes that shows that he made some decisions by even telling the dreams to his brothers and to his father, you're going to be worshiping or serving me, not worshiping him but serving me, bowing down to me. And they resented that. What if he just kept that to himself and prayed to God about it? See, he didn't have to say everything that he, know, uh, that he knew. And so the decisions that we make sometimes affect those around us. Think of, again about the father in the home. He decides, well, Sunday's the only day that I get off. It's the only day that I have a an opportunity to go fishing or to play golf. And so I'm not going to worship service. Y'all go on. That, that, that's fine. Y'all go on. That decision that he has made has influenced those children. Just wait till some of those children get a little bit older. And they want to stay home with daddy or go with daddy. What do you say then? See, they have affected them for the rest of their life. They have set a pattern for them. And the decisions that we make every day of our lives affects us, but not only us, it affects those around us. It affects those that we work with. It affects our neighbors. But mainly it affects those that are under our roof. Number four, examine your family dynamics. We need to take the time to stop, and I want to read a passage for you. This was what was read for us uh, by Philip just a moment ago. Wherefore, put in the way lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now, the, uh, this may be a different passage than Philip read. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. How much, how often do we do that? Rather, we have to examine what we're doing. I have to examine myself first as a father and a husband. I have to examine myself. I realize that I'm not an elder now, but you can still see the application. When I was an elder, I had to examine myself. What example am I setting 
as an elder. But now one that certainly still applies, what example would the decisions that I make as a preacher? They're going to affect you in some way. Now, hopefully, even if I made the wrong decisions, you would be strong enough to do right anyway. But what about somebody that was not strong enough to do that? You see, our decisions can affect those around us, can't they? It, it does make a difference what we do and what we say and what others see coming out of our mouths, the places that we go, sometimes the places that we don't go. But what about when there is a work day? What about when there is a gospel meeting? What about when there is a VBS? We make appointments and we put them on our calendar. Somebody already sent, sent me in a mail a uh, calendar for 2023. They want me to be ready. I've got it saved. Next year, you know what's on my calendar? Uh, Tina's list, and she already knows. This is if it, uh, if it goes through. It's uh, not gone through since 2019 because of COVID and other reasons now. We have a trip planned to Alaska. We have date set, Anthony and Claudia. I know you two like to travel. We've got those marked on the calendar. They've been set aside. Why? It means something to us. Well, we spent that money. I'm not, I don't want to waste, waste that money. Plus, I want to see that beauty that God has created. I want to see the glaciers. If my back would hold out, I'd sh sure like to make a fishing trip up there. That is yet to be seen. We'll, we'll just leave that in that category. But I'm, I made a point to mark it down. But did I write down about the gospel meeting? Did I write down about our vacation Bible school? Or do I just take it? Well, if I'm available, I'll do it if I, you know, if I can. It doesn't matter. It does matter, doesn't it? It matters to us, me, to you. It also matters to God. God sees what is important to us. God sees, Mark, that trip to Alaska was more important to you than serving me. God would see that, wouldn't he? God would also see, if I put those other things down on that calendar, he would say, Mark, I am glad that you're my servant. So either way I, I decide to make the decision, it does affect somebody, and it affects our own eternal salvation, where we will be forever. Now the passage that Philip read. I was one ahead of myself. At least I'm ahead, not behind. Let all bitterness and wrath, this is Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, none of us would ever do that, right? They do that other places. Be put away from you. That, that word anger, I've never been angry, have you? With all malice, but now it tells you what to do. Not only put these away, here's what you need to do. And be you kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Oh, you remember what I just mentioned as number four? Examining. There's a lot there for me to examine. I don't, uh, you two remember this, but I made this statement. Claudia and Anthony picked us up at the airport when we returned from polishing the pulpit. You say, well, they went too, so how'd they pick you up at the airport? We stayed longer than they did, so that's how that worked out. But on the way back, after hearing all those great sermons, lectures, classes, whatever you want to say, I said, I, I see, I've got a lot of examining that I need to do. Don't we need to do that? Really, we need to do it every day, but certainly we need to do it on occasion. What am I doing? I, I do have a purpose. God has given me a purpose in life, and I need to know what it is. It's to bring glory unto him and to prepare myself to go to heaven. It's not to see how much money I can have. You can't take that with you anyway. We'll look at some of that tonight. But I do have a purpose. Rather than examine yourself, now, 
Now, let's stop and think for a moment. Isn't it so easy to examine somebody else? Butch, I got some things down that I wrote down about you that uh, you need to examine about this. Scott, I got a list on you too. What about me? Never thought about that way. Uh, we're not going to do that. The, am I getting close to home sometimes, what we do? If we're honest, am I getting close to home as to what we do? I'm going to have to say for, for me. I'm not saying about anybody else now. For me, yes. It's things I need to work on. All right, number five. Examine your humility. We need to be humble people. Never boastful people. Something I want you to think about. We get into conversations with people on a regular basis right here in the auditorium, out in the foyer, at, at work, wherever you are. Later on in the day after that conversation has taken place, do you remember what you said to the other person? Oh, yes, because I was wanting to say things so badly. I remember what I said. Do you remember what the other person said? No, because I wanted to say what I wanted to say so bad I don't even know what they were talking about. Have we ever done that? I, I think I have. I think I've done that so much uh, rather than waiting to hear their point, I was wanting to make my point. Have we ever done that? Of course we have. So we have to sh show humility. We have to humble ourselves. Notice this. In Philippians 2, 3 through 5. I keep thinking it's on the board, and I don't have to tell you what passage it's in. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Help them. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What a challenge. Now, we know that we'll never fully live up to that. I'm not going to fully live up to being, having the mind completely of Christ. Can't do it. I'm not deity. But I do have the standard that I'm supposed to follow, don't I? We have that standard by which we are supposed to go by. Rather than me being built up, look on the other people. Help bring them up. If you read this edition of the House to House, you'll see some of the very things I'm talking about in this edition. It just came yesterday. Uh, a few people went out door knocking yesterday, and we appreciate that. And then the House to House came in later in the day after they, they went. But, uh, hey, we're going to have door meetings uh, anyway to try to accommodate for this House to House issue. But read this one. You'll see some of the very points that I'm talking about, but that humility, looking on the needs of others, not just what I need. Well, I need this, and I need that. Think about our prayers. Now, I'm not, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying it's wrong to ask God for our needs. We do that. Jesus told us to do that. Ask in my name, and it shall be given. All right, we understand that. But this is what I want you to do. When we pray, Make sure that it's not always just about what I need. Sometimes it needs to be thanking God for what he's done. What he's already given us. What he has in store for us. Not just what I need. And thinking about the sacrifice that Jesus made. But never forget about the sacrifice that the father made. In sending his son... I mentioned earlier about there's ne never a minor surgery for our children. What about a child dying on the cross? What about the Son of God on the cross of Calvary? That's a lot to think about, isn't it? Now, Joseph made, had that coat of many colors. His brothers saw that. They wanted to kill him. That's not humility. One of them, Reuben, finally talked them into selling him. But what happened after that? He went into prison. He was a slave. God had other plans for him. Now Joseph had some things that he did when he was 17, showing his immaturity. Joseph 
grew. He grew a lot in following God. He he became second in command in all of Egypt, only under Pharaoh. And what happened about those dreams that he had? His family, his own people, his brothers, his father, they needed help. Where did they come? Let's go down to Egypt and buy the things that we need. They did. Who helped them? Of course, God. But who was there? His brothers helped him. They didn't recognize him at first. He recognized them. Those dreams that he had came true. Now, back at that that time, remember, dreams were different than us just having a dream today. God sent him a dream that actually meant something that was going to happen. And it was fulfilled They did come to him, the one in control, and had to ask from him. He could have had them killed had he chose to. He chose not to. He even wept at one point because his brothers were there now again, and he got to see his father. See, that's what meant more to him than getting vengeance. Remember the verse that we just read a moment ago? All the family meant so much more to him. Now, in Ephesians 5, 26, it says, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. God didn't warn us about that because we're not, we would never do it. He knows we're in danger of doing it sometime. Final point, number six. Examine your store. See what's there. One final verse, Ephesians 4, 29. The Apostle Paul, writer of the church at Ephesus, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. What's in store? What's up here? That's, That's what we're talking about. Because what's up here is going to come out down here. But all the wrong things up here, that's what's going to come out and what people hear. You ever hear somebody who says, pardon my French? What does that mean? They just used profanity, didn't they? Well, it's not really to be pardoned that way. That does, just because you say that phrase does, doesn't mean it's, uh, it's forgiven. You have to repent of that. So what do we have in store? What have we put aside spiritually? How do we live our lives? Do you realize, in, just in the congregation here, now, I don't mean this in any kind of bad way. Don't, don't think of it that way. I mean this in a good way. So I want you to think of it that way. We all have faults of each other as how we imagine them. Each Each other. You know, I, I think of Butch, you know, we serve together side by side as elders, so I think of a lot of the conversations that we, we had. We, we have spent a lot of hours in conversations together, well, so I have some thoughts about that. Well, others I have thoughts about as well, so do you. I want you to be able to have some good thoughts about me by setting the right standard, by storing up the right thing. Let each of us do that. Now, something I thought about as I was sitting down here on the front row, when we're broadcasting such as we are, I do look at it, and, you know, sometimes we'll say, well, we don't see somebody that's not a member of the church. What if somebody watches the video or is watching live that's not a member? So guess what, preacher, that's behind the pulpit? You need to cover the plan of salvation anyway, don't you? What must we do to be saved? What does the Bible say? What did God say? Man has a lot of thoughts as to what we should say, but what did God say that I must do? I want to know what God said. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. See them doing on the day of Pentecost when the first gospel sermon was preached there in Jerusalem. In AD 33, they proclaimed the word of God. They were convicted of their sins. 
They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They now believe on Jesus as the Christ. We believe. Now, we that believe, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. That's what we must do for the remission of sins. That's a plan that we can all understand. Now, men will say other things. You never go wrong when you do what God said. You never go wrong when you do what God said. Now, what if I'm a child of God and there's something that I need to take care of that I'm not setting that, exa that example for everybody else to see, even in my home? If I'm not doing what I should do, I need to ask God to forgive me even if I have initially obeyed the gospel. And sometimes, because we are going through things, do you think Tish Clark and B.J. Clark would have wanted your prayers? That's an easy one, isn't it? So sometimes we need to ask for prayers for each other, don't we? Nothing wrong with doing that. This morning, if we can help you in any way, please let it be known as we stand and as we sing. At this time, we had the opportunity to give back a small portion of that which our Father has so greatly blessed us with in the past week. And let us not think of it as just blessings in a monetary sense. No. Think of the blessings that we do not comprehend. The very next heartbeat, the next breath blessings of fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's go to prayer. Gracious and heavenly Father, we are so thankful again, Father, for the blessings that you have given us each and every day of this past week, Father. And Father, we ask, we, we know the blessings that you have planned for us in the coming week. We thank you for them also, Father. At this time, Father, we pray a blessing upon that which is being returned into thy house. We ask, Father, that whatever is given is given us with gladness of heart, and that it is used righteously in thy sight, Father, that we may be able to bring thy light into this dying world around us, Father. These things we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.